Thank you for coming to our talk. So, um, yeah, my name is Max and with me is Robert. And we are both committers at the Apache Beam project. And today uh, we would like to show you a really cool um, use case for machine learning with Apache Beam. Um, as, you, as you may know, um, Apache Beam enables you to um, run your um, data processing stream or batch processing jobs on top of Apache Flink, Apache Spark, and uh, Google Cloud Dataflow, and there are also some other uh, runners. And um, yeah, but more importantly also, um, you, you, you not only get to choose your execution engine, but you also can um, use your favorite programming language. And today we want to talk about um, how to run Python pipelines on, um, with Apache Bean. Um, and yeah, so let's dive right into it. So first, Robert will give you a short uh, introduction to uh, Apache Beam itself in case you, it's just gonna be, be brief in case you are not so familiar with it yet. And, and then we will talk a little bit about portability. So this is basically what enables you to run, to write in a different programming language than Java or a JVM language and um, being able to execute um, that, that pipelines uh, with, with Beam. Um, there's a full in-depth technical talk tomorrow by um, Alyosha and uh, Thomas Weiser. And um, yeah, this talk is gonna be shorter. So uh, just a quick overview. And then uh, we will do a, li a little bit uh, an introduction to TFX, which is like a platform for TensorFlow. It's like an extension to send on TensorFlow. And then we'll do a demo. And yeah, that being said, um, I leave the stage to Robert. Thank you. Okay. So as mentioned, we're gonna start talking a little bit about what is Apache Beam. So Apache Beam is a unified batch and streaming distributed processing API. So you can write your pipeline once and then you can run it in batch or you can run it in a streaming mode. And uh, what Beam provides is it provides a, a set of SDK front ends. So you can write the pipeline in the language of your choosing. So you can write in Java and Python and Go. You can write in Scala, you can write SQL. And then it's extensible, so you can extend, you can write your own. And this allows you to write in the language you're comfortable with, and more importantly, to use the ecosystem and environment and libraries that you want to do to get your job done, which, which depending on your job might be, you know, a different language. And then the other thing that Beam provides is it provides a set of runners. So a runner is something that can execute a Beam pipeline. And um, so we have several backends you can run locally, you can run on Flink, you can run on Spark, you can run on Dataflow, Samza, and this is also extensible. So if you have some data processing engine, you can, if you, if you write the interface, you can actually make it run Beam pipelines. So this is kind of an overview of what Apache Beam is. And our vision is really to provide a comprehensive portability framework for data processing pipelines so that you can write your pipeline in the language of your choice and then run it with minimal effort on the execution engine of your choice. And really to provide the ability to mix and match whatever you wanna write your pipeline with, write it once, and then run it on whatever backend. And if you decide you wanna to switch to a different backend tomorrow, you can try it on a different backend, or you can do it on two backends at once and see which finishes first, or whichever, whichever way you wanna do it. So this, in a nutshell, is what Beam is all about. So let's look at a very simple Beam pipeline. So a P collection is kind of like a data set or it's data set and data stream together. And say I have input, I have a mobile gaming application and I've input all the points people are scoring. And I say, you know what? I want to know what the scores are. Let's sum up all the points that everyone has. So this is about the ba most basic pipeline you can have. Um, sum integers is a, is a transformation that just sums all the points scored by key. Here the keys are users. And um, essentially, this is great if you want to say, you know, sum up over high scores for uh, the heat death of the universe, but you say, well, what if I want real-time updates? People are playing 24 seven. I wanna know what, you know, what's the high score for the day? Um, what's the high score of, of all time and stuff like that. So Beam actually pioneered this uh, very flexible windowing event-driven model where you, you can separate what you're trying to compute from where in event time you're trying to compute it, when in real time you're actually performing the aggregations, and then if there are multiple aggregations, how those aggregations relate to each other. So this is kind of a really um, fundamental uh, part of Beam is the, the, it's a really expressive framework, but we try to do things in a modular way. And um, this is the Java API. The other important thing about Beam is we really want Beam to, the Beam model to carry through to different languages. So you can see the Java is here. We also have a Python API. So here's exactly the same Pine, but this is written in Python. And, uh, and you can see we, uh, it's, it's more Pythonic. Um, this bar here is actually a, um, not necessarily Pythonic. We tried, we, we went through a lot of iterations here. So, but imagine it's Bash. 
So you take the input, you pipe it into a windowing operation, you pipe it into a combined operation, and there's your result. So this is, uh, this is the Beam model, and we also provide Go, and there's, uh, there's Scala and um, SQL as well. And then the other thing is, so we have a pipeline. How do we get input and output? So what do we do is reading and writing are just other operations that you can do. And so here we're reading from a text file, but for instance, there's the, the reading and writing is a very powerful framework. We can actually read from a collection of text files by just specifying the file names that may be coming in a stream in real time and then read the elements out of those. And if those collect files are big, it's dynamically chopped up into pieces and all that good stuff. And then likewise, um, the, the outputs are also just, uh, just operations that you apply your to your data to export your data. So now we have a complete pipeline, reading in some stuff, performing some aggregations, writing the results, and we want to run this thing. So you define your pipeline. Notice that the pipeline is completely runner agnostic, and then you run your pipeline. And you just choose the runner, and you say, OK, run this pipeline on this runner, and off it goes. So that's Beam in a nutshell. Thanks, Robert. So um, as I said in the beginning, uh, we want to give you a little bit of uh, insight how this actually works on the hood. Um, and this is what we refer to as uh, portability in Beam. Um, so normally, um, like when you use a data processing framework, you're typically um, tied to a single language. Um, that's for Apache project, usually Java, um, or um, JVM dialects like Scala or uh, Clojure. Um, but Beam's vision, um, as Robert already pointed out, was really to, to uh, support multiple uh, languages, the writing pipelines in multiple languages. And um, the way this works is that we construct like a, um, via this what we call runner API, like a universal representation um, of that pipeline. And so this is like a standard spec kind of. But of course, it contains um, code, um, for example, from Python or Java that the runner, which is uh, written in, in Java, not necessarily understands because, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different uh, execution environment. Um, so, but supporting this is really powerful because you can write your own code in Python, you can, in your Duofan, you can, um, you can um, use your favorite libraries like TensorFlow or anything else. So we really want to want to be able to, to execute this as well. And this is, this is made possible by this fun API, which basically brings up a language-specific environment whenever we need it and um, runs the Python code or any code that is not native to Java, because this layer is just Java, uh, yeah, which runs it there um, um, in this special execution environment. So a um, little bit more insight maybe how this works. So very simplified, before we had portability, um, basically uh, Beam was structured like this. This is a great simplification, of course. Um, there's the SDK, so that's, that's where you write your um, pipeli pipelines with, what Robert showed. Um, and um, then you have the runner, which um, uh, takes this definition and somehow figures out a way to map this to um, Flink tasks, for example, or any other execution backends. And this all works like really well, but uh, you only ever be able to use like a single language or environment like the JVM. Um, so, to make this a bit more flexible, um, we actually introduced, well, an SDK for multiple languages. Obviously, you have to write that. And um, then also to be independent of, like, the execution in itself, how you submit your job, you know, and Spark and Fling, there are different ways to actually, like, get your job running. We have this job server and the job API, which um, takes care of... Um, receiving like a pipeline and making sure it executes in the backend. And then the runner, and for example, the Flink runner, it, it sub submits this portable job to, to, um, to, the f to Flink. And whenever we have something like language agnostic, like for example, uh, like a key bind Flink or so, where we don't have run any user code, then we can directly execute this here. Um, but if we have, for example, Python code, we bring up this SDK harness which is specific to Python or Go, like to the language which you are running. So you have to you have to do sort of do this work, implement SDK and the harness, and then like this F, this FN API, it, it manages all the in, like pr provides the input to the process and gets the output side side inputs and all the features that Beam supports. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. So um, 
we hope that in the future we, we can even have more, more languages. Um, but as of now, it's um, um, Java, um, Python, and Go, and, and SQL is also being worked on. Yeah, so now we can dive into TFX. OK. So now uh, I'm sure that at least half of you came to this talk because you saw the title Machine Learning. So far, we have not you know, talked about that at all. So what is TFX? Um, so how many of you recognize TensorFlow, TF? OK, good number. Yeah, so TFX is, was developed for the realization that whenever you do machine learning at scale, you have the little machine learning part, you know, what model, how many you know, layers have your neural net. You spend a lot of time there. But then when you actually go to actually run this, you have to worry about so much more than the actual machine learning. You have to worry about validation. You have to worry about monitoring and configuring and pre-processing and, and all these other components here. And so some folks at the TFX uh, at the, on the TensorFlow team um, kind of noticed a pattern in all their users were having to worry about all this stuff that was not TensorFlow itself. And so they came up with uh, TensorFlow Extended, which is a framework that allows you to easily use TensorFlow in a, a big data setting. So you do, uh, so these are some of the components of the framework here. Um, you do data ingestion, analysis of your data, transformations of your data, uh, model validation. And you notice a lot of these are actually um, just pipelines that you want to do to your data. And they're powered actually under the hood by Apache Beam. So TensorFlow Extended is built on top of Apache Beam. And these are um, currently being, uh, they're in the process of being uh, um, developed and open sourced. The ones, the ones in gold there are already available for everyone, and uh, the other ones are hopefully coming soon. And so to give you, a, I'm going to talk a little bit about two of them. So the first one is uh, TensorFlow Transform. And TensorFlow Transform, like its name, it's where you transform your data before you train it. And this is where you do your pre-processing, you do your normalization, you do vocab generation, um, statistics. And one of the innovations about TensorFlow Transform is in addition to the transformed data as an output to your pipeline, the transformation itself is another output to your pipeline. And this is really important to avoid training serving skew, because it doesn't matter how well you train your model. If you're doing different transformations when you're serving it, you're just going to get bad results out. So um, this, is, this is TensorFlow Transform. And then the other, uh, the other big one that we've released recently is TensorFlow Model Analysis. And TensorFlow Model Analysis allows you to analyze your model once it's been trained to see, really, is it a, is it a good model? And typically, when you're training, you might have some ROC curve. And that gives you some kind of an idea of how, how, how well it performs in aggregate. But you really want to understand how well does it perform for different subsets of the population. Um, you want to slice and dice across all different kinds of metrics so, so that even if it's an aggregate worse, there's no one who's really losing out because they happen to be in some, some segment of the population that the model just chose to ignore or was underrepresented or something like that. And um, so this is really important for, for instance, discovering and investigating bias that might crop in your, up in your models, either due to the way you construct the model or possibly bias that was already in the data itself, or just because of you know, how it was represented. And so, um, so I'm going to go into, I'm going to do a demo of uh, TensorFlow model analysis. So let's hope that this works. So right here, I have uh, the TensorFlow model analysis notebook. This is um, almost the vanilla notebook from the uh, uh, model analysis uh, website. I, I changed some things just to, just to make the demo sm flow more smoothly. But you can, uh, you can, the full demo is up here. You can see what, how small the changes were. So this is kind of an end-to-end -end example. I'm going to just go through, because uh, for the sake of time, to the very last part. And this is how we run the TensorFlow model analysis. Um, I don't think you can see, but uh, let's. So up at the top here, I'm defining a pipeline. This is exactly like the simple pipeline that I had, um, just a little bit more, uh, more code there. And then this bottom part right here, this bottom chunk is saying, I want to run it on this runner. And right now, I'm configuring it to run on a Flink cluster that's locally working on my computer. So let's run this. And it's, right now, what it's doing is it's firing off a pipeline to a Flink cluster that I started earlier. So hopefully uh, in a minute here, we'll have the job come up. And so what this is doing is we have a Python, Python script that is composing a language-independent representation and sending it to a Flink job server. And the Flink job server is understanding this representation, unpacking it, optimizing it, and then sending it off to my local cluster. And here is the pipeline that I'm running. So it's not that big, but it's, uh, you can kind of see it has about maybe two dozen stages in it. Um, and various stages of completion. Uh, I'm not running over a huge data set, so they're finishing pretty quickly. 
And so each one of these workers is actually taking the description of the pipeline, and it's a language agnostic description. It says, oh, here's a chunk of code that needs to be executed in a Python environment. So what it does is the first time it fires off a Docker container, and hopefully um, then from subsequent things that use it reuses that Docker container and says, here's a chunk of code that I don't understand, but you do, and plums the data through it in a streaming manner and pulls the data out of it in a streaming manner. And so then uh, this goes through, and it looks like our pipeline completed successfully. So let's go back and look at the results. Almost completed. So the pipeline completed successfully. Now the driver is packaging up the results and sending them back to the, the worker and so on, I hope. OK. This is the problem with doing a live demo. Oh, OK, never mind. Our pipeline is still running. So there's some stage that is still pending. So, um, So while that's running, usually usually it would have finished by now. Let's uh, so the the results of this pipeline. Okay, well uh, let's. Well, that, that was our last slide, so let's go to questions, and then uh, if we have a minute afterwards, we can see if, uh, if it actually completed. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, so check out the, the Beam website, the documentation, and examples, and um, we're happy to, to hear any feedback on the main list or join the Slack, Slack channel. It's really active. Um, yeah, and be part of the Beam community. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are any questions. Um, hello. Thanks you for this presentation. I have only one question that regarding the runner, if I can run it over the um, multiple backend. So the Betsy Beam uh, runner can work in the Flink, for example, and Google Data Workflow at the same time. So we have some kind of integration after we get data from here and get data from here. We have done something like that. We have a tool for integration or something like that. Or okay, so shall I do it manual? Yeah, so what happens is you define your pipeline, and then you send your pipeline to the runner, and it runs it in its entirety. So you'd send, you would run the entire pipeline on one runner. And you could, for instance, you know, run one pipeline on run one runner and have it write outputs, and then on another runner have it read those outputs and, and continue from there if you wanted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, snatched in between. Uh, the obvious question, probably you get asked that a lot. Uh, what's the overhead of actually executing your code like in a Python environment running in a separate instance? Yeah, that's, that's a very it's good question. probably evergreen, isn't it? Yeah, so our initial measurements for Java on Java was that there was anywhere between a 5 and 15% overhead on if you just had the identity do fun in Java. So where it sends the things over and immediately sends it right back. Um, and... There are known optimizations we could do. We think we can get that under 5%. And actually, that's 5% in the worst case if you don't actually didn't do anything on the worker. But chances are, if you're sending data over there, it's because you want to do something, and so that becomes much smaller. So we're thinking you know, under 5%, probably significantly under 5% if you're actually doing any work. So which is, which we had to do a lot of work there. So it actually streams data in and asynchronously so pulls data out. Um, because actually, like, you know, sending a request and waiting for the response, that was a huge overhead. Good question. Thanks. Um, can you tell us more about the uh, Docker image? Uh, so do I understand this correctly? The harness uh, uh, uses a Docker image. Where does it come from? Uh, how is it built? What environment is it in? in Python 2.7.3? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So the the image itself. So we have what we do. What we do is we're shipping standard images that build the SDK in. And then when you launch a pipeline, you provide whatever image. Is, it's part of one of the pipeline configurations is what image should this, this do fund be running? If you say the standard image, there's a way to stage files and dependencies into that image. Or you can just build your own image however you want. 
and then say, use this image over here. And this is if you want to have complete customization over your environment. Um, and all that matters is that you have the right entry point that speaks the protocol. And the standard image also comes like with a lot of popular li libraries already, so it's a it's a good default. But you can specify your own image. You just have to provide like a registry inf point where where it can be downloaded. And also, sorry, the configuration there is like a part of the pipeline which is called the uh, the pipeline options. And there you said uh, you say there you said the the runner and um, any other configuration. Um, so, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so here, here's the configuration. I would have, if I was not using the standard one, I'd have a, I don't remember, it was, you know, Docker environment equals, and you just give it a path to a, uh, something that Docker can pull. And there you have it. Yep. Yeah. And also there's, uh, there's now just some work being done um, on, like, uh, ha having an option to deploy it without Docker. So where you just fork off a process, because in some environments you might already have um, everything set up and you don't need this Docker overhead. So that's also going to be a possibility in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, quick final question. Um, how, how do you keep up with uh, the development of Flink, for example, uh, new features coming in 1.5, 1.6? That's a very interesting and good question. Um, so I think ultimately this is uh, gonna be have to be worked out um, in the community because um, as of now, we basically are always trying to stay on par with the latest Flink release. So whenever Flink is upgraded or a new Flink release is, is available, then the next version of Beam will, will have it. Um, that's, that's the current state. Maybe in the future we will default to to only supporting like long-term releases of flink or something like that so th that you run into less problems when you when you upgrade your jobs or your flink so you don't have to upgrade your flink cluster or your jobs like that regularly um, this is still um, has to be worked out thank well, you very much once again uh, yeah please Th thanks